Testing. It's a little loud. Testing. Okay. Testing volume, testing volume, testing volume, testing volume. How's this? Is this good? Yes. Sounds good to me. Welcome. Good evening. How are you? Awesome. So for those that are not aware of it, uh, tonight I'm going to read from and comment on and perhaps take some questions on the Tao Te Ching. So, oh. <laughs> I guess somebody didn't know yet. Um, I'll read this introductory portion, which is about a page and a half. The Tao Te Ching is an ancient Chinese text consisting of spiritual teachings, folk, wisdom, political instruction, cosmology, observations of nature, anti-Confucian doctrine, and mystical insights. Just as the Chinese language has experienced numerous, transfer numerous transformations, the Tao Te Ching has changed and evolved over time. The present form of the Tao Te Ching is an amalgam of the combined wisdom and insights of the many Chinese sages, which took form between the 7th and 2nd century BC. Legend, however, gives us a more animated account of the Tao Te Ching's origin. It says that during the time of Confucius, around 500 BC, Lao Tzu practiced Tao and De, which are actually written with T's, but pronounced as Tao and De, the supreme way and its expression, Tao being the supreme way, De being its expression, and focused his teachings on humility and being nameless. He was keeper of the royal archives in the state of Chao, or Chu, I'm not sure. After he foresaw that the state would fall into decay, he packed his belongings and decided to leave through the western gateway. The gatekeeper, Yin Shi, Yin Hish, Yin Hish, something like that, Yin Hishi, seeing that this great sage was about to leave the world, said, Master, you are about to renounce the world. Please compose a book for me. Thereupon the old master came down from his ox cart, took out his pen and ink, and began to compose a book of two parts, discussing Tao and De. Several hours later, Lao Tzu handed the finished text of slightly more than 5,000 characters to the gatekeeper and then departed toward the west. This popular story, however implausible, holds the symbolic charm that is consistent with the spirit of the Tao Te Ching. The verses were given to a gatekeeper, which represents their power to open the gate of understanding. It also symbolizes a turning point in one's life. The entire book was given at a simple request, which shows the generosity of the sage and how he poured forth his knowledge at the first opening of a seeker. Lao Tzu wrote the book in a single sitting, which is an example of the sage's one-pointedness and perseverance. The sage came down from his ox cart, a scene often depicted in Chinese art, demonstrating his humility. He also left toward the West, which symbolizes that the teachings of the Tao Te Ching are universal and meant for all people, a reality that we now see manifest. Tao is the supreme reality, the all-pervasive substratum, it is the whole universe and the way the universe operates. De is the shape and power of Tao. It is the way Tao manifests. It is Tao particular, particularized to a form or a virtue. Tao is the transcendent reality. De is the immanent reality. Ching means a book or a classic work. Hence, the Tao De Ching literally means the classic book of the supreme reality and its perfect manifestation the book of the way and its power, the classic of Tao and its virtue. Pretty neat, huh? Let's see. Is there anyone that wants to be a, a mic runner in case we have questions from the audience? Awesome, thank you.
I will not comment on every single detail, and we probably I probably won't finish this book in this session. Um, so I'll just start commenting and um, taking your questions, prefers, and then later on, I think November or December something, we have another one of these meetings, and then until we're done at some point. So I'll space them out so not every meeting in a row is about the Tao Te Ching. I'll just highlight or mention what I feel may be relevant or maybe a beautiful um, point to comment on, and then I may take your questions. A way that can be walked is not the way. Just relax for a second. Just take a deep breath. Feel your body, feel your mind perhaps, and just give your concerns back to God. Give your stress back to life. Give your thoughts back to the universe. Unburden yourselves, get comfortable, enjoy this moment. And just naturally, without trying, absorb the words. A way that can be walked is not the way. A name that can be named is not the name. Tao is both named and nameless. As nameless, it is the origin of all things. As named, it is the mother of all things. A mind free of thought, merged within itself, beholds the essence of Tao. A mind filled with thought, sorry, the first one was, a mind free of thought, merged within itself, beholds the essence of Tao. A mind filled with thought, identified with its own perceptions, beholds the mere forms of this world. Tao and this world seem different, but in truth, they are one and the same. The only difference is in what we call them. How deep and mysterious is this unity, how profound, how great. It is the truth beyond the truth, the hidden within the hidden. It is the path to all wonder, the gate to the essence of everything. So that is the opening verse, and it is one of the more um, fundamental ones, and it holds a lot of subtleties that um, I will address. I'll address most of what I just shared because it's so rich with content and diversity and distinctions and pointers. A way that can be walked is not the way. You've probably heard similar slogans from spiritual teachers, meaning that, or a name that can be named is not the name, meaning that as soon as we collapse into into labeling, as soon as we collapse into finger pointing, as soon as we collapse into oh, this is what that is, or I have found the answer, or now I'm enlightened because of this or that experience. As soon as we can walk the way, as soon as we can name the name, it's not the name. It's not the actual original space from which the uh, initial experience or glimpse occurred to begin with. So the human tendency, the mind's tendency, is to immediately capture every experience into um, a construct into a mental concept. And so it's very helpful as a spiritual seeker, as a journeyer, that you can become very aware of this need of the human mind to label things, because that way it feels safe. That way it can feel who it is in relationship to it, which is not always a bad thing. But when it comes to actually sinking deeper and deeper into your self-realization, it's very helpful to consistently be able to let go and see through mental construct and see that the things you appoint as the truth are simply experiences or forms of the truth, but they're not the truth. The truth cannot, in that sense, be brought down to a single concept, to a thought, to a workable construct. So as you gain deeper senses or experiences of being what you truly are, of the truth of reality. It's very helpful to have this attitude of consistently being able to give back your realizations to life rather than hold on to what you've realized. Because as soon as you hold on to your realizations, it grows stagnant. It is like a pond of water that doesn't flow anymore. It becomes polluted. It becomes nasty. All kinds of germs start 
making it their home. So as soon as we collapse into a concept of, okay, I know what this is all about, or I have realized, or I am enlightened, or this is what the truth is, or that experience is what it's like, then we tend to block that river from flowing. We tend to turn it into a pond that over time just becomes exhausted and polluted. And we start to feel that too. Initially, these pointers, they feel great and we get genuine access to genuine flow, genuine realization. And then after a while, if we perpetuate the same pointer for too long, it grows exhausting. It exhausts its potency. And you may feel this in any type of pointer, even as simple as I am, recognize that I am. That may be a very, point, uh, very powerful pointer for you to rest as the I am. But at some point, perhaps the pointer grows stale. It doesn't have the potency anymore for you in that moment. Doesn't mean it can never recapture that same potency, but it means you have to take a break from that particular pointer, from that particular angle. Your spirit in a, in a way wants to expand upon the ways through which it knows itself and recognizes itself. Tao is both named and nameless. So previously, it shared that Tao means the, the essence of everything, right? The substratum, the sort of grandness, the, um, the absolute or the ultimate, whereas they refers to sort of the individual application of that, the manifestation of that, the embodiment of that in form, in action, through one of you, for example. Now it says, it makes a refinement as to what Tao is, so it doesn't even talk about day, it doesn't even talk about the expression. So these two things that are named here under Tao are not to be confused with Tao and day. And I'll explain a little more if this is not clear yet. Tao is both named and nameless. So this refers purely to the absolute. So it makes a distinction between the absolute and the absolute. Both named and nameless. As nameless, it is the origin of all things. As named, it is the mother of all things. Now every once in a while I'll also relate this back to my teachings for those that are following my teachings and are familiar with that construct. So as nameless, it is the origin of all things, the source. It's what I call the absolute or the one or beyondness. It is the origin of all things. It's not all things. It's not even the essence of all things. The essence implies what things are made out of. But Tao as nameless is actually even beyond that. It's more ingraspable than that. It is the origin of the mother of all things. It is the origin of the essence that then expresses itself in all kinds of days, in all kinds of ways. So Tao is both named and nameless. As nameless, it is the origin of all things. As named, it is the mother of all things. The essence, in other words, the overarching presence. So then, to relate that back to my teachings, for those that are curious, named the mother of all things. Tao as the named mother of all things is the Absolute, I don't call that the absolute, but it's the, the presence that pervades every experience, right? So when you give up your thoughts for just a moment, for two to five seconds, if you're thoughtless, which the next verse part instructs, if you just for two to five seconds, let go of your thoughts, just let go of your thoughts. And you notice that there is an alive presence here. Can you notice that? There is a presence to this moment. There is a presence to your hand, there is a presence to my words. There is a presence here that you can find in the chair, in the carpet, in the space, in the air you're breathing, in the voice that I have. There is a presence in this moment. That is the mother of all things. That is Tao as named, that is Tao manifest. That is its first expression. That is the field of unconditional love out of which everything else arises. Tao as nameless, is in a sense then beyond that. It is the truly ingraspable. It is the origin of all things. Now, if something has presence, it must have a cause. It must have a creator. It must have a source. It must have an origin. This is not very hard to discover. It's very logical, in fact. So you tune into the presence that pervades everything, the presence that is all that is, the presence energy that makes up every single form and creation. You tune into, you become aligned with the mother of all things, the presence of the here and now. And then you notice or realize that because it has presence, because creation is present, it must have an origin. 
because it is. Anything that is created must have a creator. And so this creator is even more indescribable. It is even more unfindable. It is nameless in that sense. It is beyondness. It is beyond consciousness. It's beyond presence. It's beyond the mother of all things. It's simply the one, infinity, source. A mind free of thought, merged within itself, beholds the essence of Tao. So just like we just did, if you relax your thoughts and you become merged within yourself, which is another way of saying your presence consciousness, presence consciousness right here, right now, consciousness of presence, consciousness of you existing, the sense I exist, I am. Free of thought for a moment, that doesn't mean there is no thought. It simply means you're free of thought. There's a difference. You don't have to beat yourself up about having thoughts. It's great if you can stop your mind for two to five seconds completely. It's a great tool. If not, it's not a problem. You can simply see that you're not your thoughts and choose to take your attention away from them, but let them be. Let them do their thing, whatever it is. Let them go crazy. But you bring your attention to merge within yourself, to rest, to rest, to abide, to rest for that moment, for those five seconds, to take a deep breath, to relax, focusing on thoughts, to merge within yourself to feel the presence that you are, the I exist, I exist, I exist, I exist, I exist, period. I exist, I exist, I am, I am, I am. It's very liberating. Beholds the essence of Tao. If you're merged within yourself, all you see is Tao, all you see is the mother of all things. A mind filled with thought, identified with its own perceptions, beholds the mere forms of this world. So the mind is always a reactive mechanism. It reacts to things. It sees things, it notices things, but then it immediately labels these things. It's very used to labeling things. It's very used to giving words to things. The entire universe, in a sense, is completely silent. The only thing that's talking is your mind. The only thing that's pinpointing what what is, that's constantly giving off labels and stories, is our mind. Nothing wrong with that. It's just really helpful to see through that. So when you are identified with those perceptions, you behold the mere forms of this world. You'll constantly be dragged into the experience of person-world consciousness, as I call it in the academy. Person-world consciousness. It's the sense of I'm the person inside of an actual world filled with things for me to focus on and reflect off of and react to. While this is very helpful and it's there for a purpose, the template of the person world consciousness reality is there for the purpose of reflection, for the purpose of expanding upon your journey. It is crucial that we do see through the illusion of that mechanism so that our sense of self rests deeper than person world consciousness. It rests at the very least in a sense, I am, I exist. That becomes that stability from which we start to sense more automatically that that is actually who we are. So then our fears and our projections start to diminish because our sense of self is no longer the person inside of a world. Nearly as much as it is naturally known to be, I exist. It's presence consciousness rather than person world consciousness. It's consciousness of presence. Doesn't mean you always have to maintain that attention span. During practice, that may be helpful to an extent to give yourself periods of time where you keep coming back to presence consciousness, keep withdrawing from person world consciousness, and keep merging within yourself, merging within yourself. But ultimately, the game is not to keep necessarily that attention span. The thing is, if for two to five seconds, 12 times a day for about three weeks, you start recognizing presence willingly, diligently, you start to give away person world consciousness identification and rest, merge within the essence of I exist. It becomes natural knowledge, like gravity. You don't think about gravity when you stand up from your chair and walk to the door. You just stand up from your chair and walk to the door. You don't have to maintain attention of gravity. You know you've embodied that recognition. Same with this. Yes, it requires some practice, some familiarization, but once you do, it becomes more natural your sense of self actually vibrationally shifts. 
into the I exist, into the essence of Tao, being merged within yourself. Tao and this world seem different, but in truth, they are one and the same. The only difference is in what we call them. So here, it makes that distinction. It starts with a few distinctions. It starts with a wisdom approach, in a sense. And then it ends with a love approach. It ends with a follow-up, in a sense, with a balancing aspect. So it starts by saying, first making a sort of cognitive distinction between Tao as named and nameless. Then it continues to give an approach as to the difference between being completely lost in day or not day, basically, not truly being an embodiment of presence, the forms of this world, and instead resting to behold the essence of Tao, merged within yourself, rooted, rested, present, conscious. And then it goes on to say, to follow up, that this world, in other words, the perceptions we have in everyday life, as well as the essence of Tao, as well as that which we sense as the presence of I exist, of I am, that everything in creation shares, they are actually not different. They are actually not separate. They are inseparable. The only difference is in what we call them. That's the only difference. Our labels, once again. So when we rest sufficiently beyond our labels, we can also start to see that, yes, there is that distinction, but there is no essential difference. And one way to show you this experientially, um, and there's many ways, but this is a principle that I call inseparability, or you could call it non-duality, or you could call it oneness, but it's the realization that's very liberating to get access to, it's the realization that the experiences you have cannot be separated out of the essence that you are. And that the essence that you are cannot be separated out of the experiences that you have. Now, ideally, this is what we wish to realize and become convinced of. Why? Because then it's no longer a matter of let me withdraw from the world and rest within myself as if there is a difference. And that's fine if that is the stage that you're at. That's completely fine. Please do honor that because it's a very relevant stage. But as soon as you start to become more rested in yourself and become more convinced of the presence that is omnipresent, then you start to sense the presence in everything too. You start to see that you cannot pull form out of consciousness. And you cannot pull consciousness out of form. Form and formless are one and the same. Emptiness is form, form is emptiness, Buddha. Ideally, we want this realization when we're talking about the way of self-realization. This is one of those crucial realizations to get access to, precisely also because it in a sense relieves you of needing to make that distinction, that separation. And you can simply rest as yourself, no matter what's going on. You can be merged within your essence and behold the essence of Tao, no matter what forms are firing off within your consciousness, no matter what experiences you're having. And that's not the only benefit. There's many benefits of this realization. One being that you start to actually be able to feel and sense your environment more as if it is your body. Because you realize that it is your body as much as your body is your body. Because where is the line drawn? Are you not experiencing that wall inside of your consciousness as much as you're experiencing this body inside of your consciousness? If you can experience even your stress factors and your perceptions and your identifications and your concerns and your fears and people and events, circumstances, if you can start to recognize that all of these are actually inseparable from the unity of presence, that they are made out of and rested in the essence of yourself. Then you gain that sense of inseparability, which is very, very empowering at the same time. How deep and mysterious is this unity? Indeed, how profound, how great? Indeed, it is the truth beyond the truth. The initial truth then could be shared to be, you're not the forms of this world, you are presence. 
the truth beyond the truth could then be. But the forms of this world are also your essence. It's a full circle. There is no two, non-duality. It is the hidden within the hidden. The initial hidden that we find, that we unveil, that we discover, what's initially hidden to us is that we are omnipresence, is that we are changeless consciousness. Usually that's hidden from us. We're identified with our perceptions. When we rest away from our perceptions for just two to five seconds, 12 times a day for at least three weeks consistently, we start to gain a real experiential realization of the first hidden truth that in fact we are consciousness, we are presence, we are not the forms of this world. Then we dig even deeper and we find another hidden within that hidden. We unveil something else which is that we cannot actually find an experience where presence consciousness is not. We cannot actually see a form in this world that consists of anything but presence consciousness. It is the path to all wonder. Inseparability definitely is wondrous. It is the gate to the essence of everything. When you realize, in a sense we could say, when you become one with everything that is more fully, but that's not true because you already are. But when you realize that things are inseparable from essence, and you start to actually sense the clarity and the vividness of presence consciousness in each moment because nothing distracts you anymore, because everything confirms presence consciousness instead of distracts from presence consciousness. That definitely is the gateway to a lot of yourself, to a lot of expansion, to a lot of clarity, to a lot of more truths being discovered, to a lot of empowerment, to a lot of quote unquote abilities or long lost sights and senses being gradually, slowly reactivated. It is the gate to the essence of everything. You can start to access anything you, because simply you know that you can access anything. You see that this is all vibrational. This entire universe is vibrational presence consciousness. There is nothing that exists outside or without consciousness. And therefore consciousness, which is also you, are you not conscious of my words? So you are consciousness. And if creation is inseparable from consciousness, it's therefore one with you. And therefore there is no real limitation in terms of what you can know, what you can tune into, what you can gain access to. And that's where the way of empowerment starts to kick in as well. It starts to be enhanced. Where you can actually start to tune into things. We could call it imagination if we want to. But imagination is the remote viewing of other parallel experiences within your consciousness. And as soon as you tune into any portion of creation through intention and consciousness, you will download the qualities of that focal point. You will actually bring that reality into your reality. You will actually shift your consciousness from this parallel reality to that parallel reality, which you intuited through imagination. So in that sense, it is the gate to the essence of everything. Everything that can be desired, everything that is holy, everything that is sacred, which is everything. Everything that is beneficial and potent. Are there any questions about this verse? Confusion? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Hold it for a second until it's green. For a second until it's green. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, can you hold it? For, yeah, it should be on though. Is it connected? It's not you. It's us. You did everything right. For now, why don't I repeat your question or confusion? Yeah, I guess what I'm not clear about. Oh, we're good to go. I guess, I guess what I'm not clear about is when you speak of 
this realization of not being separate and of experiencing infinite possibilities, my confusion is where does the impulse for discovery come from if there isn't any sense of me and other? Mm. And I guess what my mind imagines is that there's a return to some kind of egoic position and I don't think that's what you're talking about. Mm. But that there is still some not just a possibility of having desire, mm -hmm. but also a kind of a, uh, some relationship that continues, mm -hmm. even in the face of that realization of inseparability. Mm -hmm. But when you start using language like, you know, what you desire, in my mind, it immediately goes back to some kind of personal me desiring something. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I'm confused because I don't think that's where you're coming from, but I don't know where that desire comes from. Awesome. All right. Yes. Thank you. When you draw poison from a snake, does the snake disappear? Does the snake become immobilized? So if you draw the poison out of the mind, will the mind disappear? If you draw the poison of believing lack can exist out of desire, does desire disappear? If you draw the poison of the belief in lack out of desire, will desire disappear? Are we on? Is it green? It's green. <laughs> okay, nice. So there's, you're naming a belief for a desire to what? In other words, desire is not the problem and it's not egoic. What is egoic is, if you want to call it egoic, is the idea that lack can exist. So lack implies something's missing which triggers desire, at least in that. It, no, it doesn't trigger desire, it triggers need. It triggers want, in that sense. It triggers okay. the need for security, for fulfillment, okay. the need for compensation, for the idea that one is lacking, or that one could be lacking. Mm -hmm. If one feels one is lacking, one will seek out whatever the opposite energy is to fulfill what one perceives to already be lacking. If one perceives one could be lacking something, one will seek out anything that could secure one's present position so that lack will not have to occur. That's such good. as pensions and jobs and all that stuff. And a good job and a good education. PhDs. They're all to secure ourselves. Does that make sense? Totally. In other words, desire itself is completely pure. It's never been egoic. It's never been selfish. It's never been lacking. In fact, desire is actually plugged into the mother of all that is meaning that it's coming from the mother of all that is. Meaning that if all parts of creation would honor their desires fully, everything would take perfectly and would be in its most effective day, state of expression of infinity. So desire is actually what you wish to clarify, what you wish to receive and embody. You wish to become friends with the energy of desire. However, to the point of your question or statement, or Confucian, we do wish to be very, very mindful of and extract from the energy of desire the filter of lack and dissolve that idea by confirming to ourselves through meditation or through confirmation or proof in any other way that lack actually has never occurred to us. And that from a universal expanded consciousness point of view, lack can never occur to us. And that, therefore we don't have to fear that lack will ever occur to us. And from that space, desire takes on a completely different quality. It already has that quality, but it's hidden within the hidden, in a sense. So when I say desire, when it comes to the gate to everything, like being inseparable, and yet I mentioned the word desire. Desire, where does it then come from? In a sense, you could say it comes from your higher consciousness. It comes from that soul counterpart of your consciousness, that sort of underlying essence within the essence like the hand that moves the fingers, 
you're one of the fingers on this level of consciousness. But simultaneously, you are also the level of consciousness of the hand that's aware of all the fingers. And that hand sees more than you see from this level of consciousness. So the soul space of consciousness or the soul level of consciousness has a greater wisdom because it sees that many more points of existence within the same space time frame as you do. So based on that, it sees what kind of theme it wishes to explore and how it can most effectively express infinity in another unique, never before attempted manner. Your physicality and your mental constitution is one of the expressions of the desire to express infinity in a way that has never before been explored. You are the expansion of the universe. You are where the one is expanding its day, its expression of itself. And so desire is a crucial part in that because without desire nothing happens. And clearly the one desires because otherwise all that is would not exist. So desire is very pure. It's actually your guidance. It's your excitement. It's your ecstasy. It's your joy. It's your bliss. What is malfunctioning is the idea that lack exists. It's the only malfunctioning thing in humanity's collective consciousness. If you can uproot, isolate, identify the beliefs that are rooted in the idea that lack has occurred, does occur, or will occur to you in your life. And if you can transform these by seeing clearly that they are not true, then you become, yes, inseparable, ecstatic, and desirous, but without the need for fulfillment, because desire itself actually is fulfillment. Rather than, oh, I'm lacking something, so then the force that's pure of desire is transformed through the lack idea into what we call needs and neediness. And that's what has caused the state of humanity to be the way that it has been. And that's why now spiritual teachings, if they're not clear enough, tend to just throw it all together in one bunch and say, oh, desire needs to be renounced. Simply due to unclear realization of the teacher or teaching. It's not actually true that desire needs to be renounced. In fact, it cannot be renounced. If it was completely renounced, all of existence would cease to exist. Desire is very pure. Desire is the sacred force that allows your finger consciousness to have some form of communication with your higher self consciousness. It communicates through passion, through inspiration, through desire. That's how it guides us most immediately. That's the highest authority to listen to, more so than anything I say or anyone else says. Does that make sense? You're really redefining desire, actually. Yes. For me. So it's helpful, yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Everyone, this is verse number two, everyone recognizes beauty only because of ugliness. Everyone recognizes virtue only because of sin. Life and death are born together. Difficult and easy, long and short, high and low. All these exist together. Sound and silence blend as one. Before and after arrive as one. The sage acts without action and teaches without talking. I'm an exception. All things <laughs> flourish around him and he does not refuse any one of them. He gives but not to receive. He works but not for reward. He completes but not for results. He does nothing for himself in this passing world so nothing he does ever passes. The first portion comments on a relative truth, a truth that applies to forms being expressed within the mother of all things. That is that polarity aspect. It is that everyone recognizes beauty because of ugliness, difficult and easy, long and short, high and low, all these exist together, before and after arrive as one. Sound and silence blend as one. Life and death are born together. It's because of one reference point that the opposite is perceived. It's because of a reference point. It's because of something that the opposite of that something is also given charge, is also immediately attracted. All points of paradox attract each other. They want to find that completion, that integration, that inclusion, that balance. So to see when you're looking upon the world and the way things work, when you can see 
that polarity as inseparable, when you see that before and after are actually one, it's another way of applying inseparability in a very experiential form. You can actually get a sense. You can actually start to feel inside of your consciousness complex polarities being inseparable. And so instead of being fooled by your identified perceptions and saying, oh, this is this and this is that, you can actually see with greater wisdom that all things are interconnected, that one thing depends on the other, and that there is no separation. The sage acts without action and teaches without talking. All things flourish around him, and he does not refuse any one of them. That's kind of an interesting sentence, is it not? It almost, from the conditioned mind, it almost seems contradictory to humility. Our idea of humility is not that things flourish around us and then we do not refuse them. Humility in our society of sin and conditioning and religion is if things flourish around you, don't accept that. If anything is given to you, if anything great is coming to you, feel really guilty about accepting it or don't accept it at all if you want to be humble. But he puts, or Dao De Ching puts, the idea of humility, because later on in the same paragraph he says, he completes but not for results. He does nothing for himself in this passing world. Therefore, nothing he does ever passes. And yet within that same, he does nothing for himself. Paragraph, it's also stated that he does not refuse any one of these things that flourish around him. So again, a paradox, and both are true. If I speak about my, my own experience, I can see that things do flourish around me. And I do not refuse any one of them. I enjoy, I feel the ecstasy, I feel the bliss of that flourishing, whether it is something that seems to happen to my body mind or seems to benefit my personal account, or whether it benefits anyone around me. There is an equal sense of joy and ecstasy when someone realizes something or when I realize something, there is an explosion of bliss. When someone is given something they've always desired, when someone achieves something within themselves, transforms something within themselves, I feel the ecstasy of that. When I do the same thing, I feel the ecstasy of that within myself. So there is no separation. I do not refuse anything. It would be arrogant to refuse the glory of all that exists. Because it's giving it to itself. And am I an outsider? That would be an arrogant, egotistical statement. That I am somehow not part of all that is. Everyone else is. You all are part of all that is, except for me. It's the ultimate egoic statement, and yet it's revered as the highest form of humility for many. Oh, if you don't take anything for yourself, you're humble. That's the most arrogant state to be in. Because it's not all one being. And to say that you're the only being in all of existence that's not part of existence, it's kind of arrogant, no? So, all things flourish around him, and he does not refuse any one of them. That's a very beautiful truth, and one that you have to adopt. You have to adopt that. You have to accept that. You have to let that in. Why do I say you have to? Because it's such a potent contradiction to all that you've been taught. And if you can let this in, you can also let in the stream of higher consciousness, the stream of love light that comes straight from the one expressing itself in form. If you do not receive good things, if you do not, if you refuse things that seem to flow through you, then you're not big enough, you're not expansive enough, you're not opened up enough to receive more of love light frequency. And so you will always stay in the perception of separation and limitation and separation. So he gives, but not to receive. This is very true at the same time. So even though I or whomsoever that is embodied in this does not refuse any good things that flourish around him, even though I do not refuse. Also, I give but not to receive. Also, I work but not for reward. Also, I complete but not for results. Also, I do not do anything for myself in this passing world. Therefore, nothing I do ever passes. You can replace that I with your I. You can feel into that. How does that feel when I say that about myself? And where is that true yet? And where is that not yet true? Just as a contrasting learning point. So how come that I do not refuse, or the sage does not refuse anything, yet he does not do anything for himself? What does that mean not to do anything for himself, not to give to receive? It means precisely that. 
when you do not refuse all that flourishes around you, which is another way of saying anything that fills up your experience of life, if you do not refuse any of that, your sense of fulfillment starts to merge with your environment. Because you're not refusing your environment as part of creation. And when you stop doing that, the inseparability starts to become energetically available, which means that you're actually expanding beyond your own individual bubble. Only someone caught in their own separation bubble would refuse anything that is given, that is beautiful, that's in alignment. A sage would not do that. And yet because the sage is the sage and they have expanded beyond their personal bubble and they have become one with their experience and they see that all is on equal ground, there is no such thing as giving to receive. Receive to where? To give to there is to receive right there. And there is as much here as here is here. Does that make sense? So if you have that non-separate view or understanding of life, then you can give because it's ecstatic to give. Because you know the second you give, you make everything flourish. And your satisfaction rises to such high degrees of vibration that you have no perceived need for getting anything in return. You want to see other people's passions flourish. You wish to see other people thrive. All the portions of creation. So in that sense, you do nothing for yourself, even when it looks like you do do something for yourself. When your bubble becomes expanded enough to really cover the entirety of what is relevant for you, meaning the experiences you have and the people that keep showing up in your life, when you're expanded enough to feel that you are these beings as much as you are yourself, that you are inseparable, then you stop doing things for yourself. Doesn't mean you don't listen to your own excitement anymore because that is still your guiding compass. However, there is not the need, there's not the lag. And so you actually become in a sense, a sort of fathering consciousness of all that is involved in your experience. And the fathering consciousness in that sense or mothering consciousness or whatever you wanna call that, all that they are concerned with in a sense is the benefit of the whole. And so if any portion of that whole, which is whatever is under the umbrella of your consciousness at that point, which at that point no longer is just your body-mind journey, it now becomes all the journeys that are relevant for you to include within your mothering or fathering consciousness. Now your body has become all of these beings. And so you do everything you do because you're motivated still for the same reasons. The same reason is still to increase bliss and ecstasy, to be as aligned as you can be. But now that's no longer just to attend to your own needs. It also starts to become to care, to take care of other portions of consciousness as if they are your own body. Does that make sense? So in that sense, everything you do in that, at that point is no longer for yourself. And ever everything you do does not pass. So it's, this is such a beautiful statement or translation. By the way, this is, um, and if anyone wants to just read through that maybe before the next session, uh, I recommend you buy this particular version. It's the definitive edition by Jonathan Starr, commentary by Jonathan Starr. It looks like this. Jonathan Starr. And um, so this is a beautiful translation. He says, he does nothing for himself in this passing world. So nothing he does ever passes. If you look at legends of our time, of our history, that, has left, that have left behind a legacy, in other words, they've contributed, and not only energetically have their actions never passed, they are still being utilized by beings across the universe for inspiration, truly inspirational acts, truly courageous acts, seemingly courageous acts, by single individuals, never pass. They are always utilized. They give up a frequency that remains available till the end of time for all other portions of that existence for whom it is relevant to tune into that lesson, into that example, into that vibration. So not only vibrationally do these things never pass, but in a lot of cases, also historically, story-wise, these things never pass. We write about them. We talk about them. Even on a physical, verbal, mental level, these things are inspiring to us. <laughs> They're epic. Film music.
So you get this sense of immortality, not only about your beingness, not only do you feel like your soul has become immortalized because of your expansion, because of your truthfulness, because of your sincerity, because of your integrity, because of your passion for all that is, because of your blending and inseparability with all that is. Not only do you feel immortalized, but you start to see that your actions, your example, is becoming edged in stone, vibrationally speaking. It is not going to pass. It will leave behind a trail for others to be inspired from. And this can be every single one of us. Every single one of us has the capacity within their own field, within their own theme of expertise, to leave behind an inspiring trail, to do things that never will come to pass. I mean, that will never pass. Does that make sense? Okay. Putting a value on status will cause people to compete. So a lot of the Tao Te Ching is also sort of political and like, how to be a leader in nature. Putting a value on status will cause people to compete. Hoarding treasure will turn them into thieves. Showing off possessions will disturb their daily lives. Thus the sage rules by stilling minds and opening hearts, by filling bellies and strengthening bones. He shows people how to be simple and live without desires to be content and not look for other ways. But the people so pure, who could trick them? What clever ideas could lead them astray? When action is pure and selfless, everything settles into its own perfect place. Verse four, Tao is empty, yet it fills every vessel with endless supply. Tao is hidden, yet it shines in every corner of the universe. With it, the sharp edges become smooth, the twisted knots loosen, the sun is softened by a cloud, the dust settles into place. So deep, so pure, so still, it has been this way forever. You may ask, whose child is it? But I cannot say, this child was here before the great ancestor. With it, the sharp edges become smooth. The twisted knots loosen, the sun is softened by cloud, the dust settles into place. When you're turned in, turned on, when you're tapped into Tao and therefore become day, It has that quality that everything you touch turns into beauty, everything you touch turns into gold, everything you touch turns into softness, however that, however that may appear. Everything, it becomes inspired. If you do not have this, then things do not seem as touched by gold and inspirational. So to be tapped into who you truly are, to be tapped into the truth of Tao, is to naturally emanate, is to naturally radiate the example of that by simply continuing to follow your own field of desire with no lack or separation included in your view. Naturally, every moment, everything you touch, every edge becomes smooth. Verse five, heaven and earth have no preference. A man may choose one over another but to heaven and earth all are the same. The high, the low, the great, the small. All are given light. All get a place to rest. The sage is like heaven and earth. To him none are especially dear, nor is there anyone he disfavors. He gives and gives without condition, offering his treasure to everyone. The universe is like a bellows. It stays empty, yet is never exhausted. It gives out, yet always brings forth more. Man is not like this. When he blows out air like a bellows, he becomes exhausted. Man was not made to blow out air. He was made to sit quietly and find the truth within. Are there any questions so far about the past few verses? 
Any confusions? Endlessly creating, endlessly pulsating. The spirit of the valley never dies. She is called the hidden creator. Although she becomes the whole universe, her immaculate purity is never lost. Although she assumes countless forms, her true identity remains intact. Whatever we see or don't see, whatever exists or doesn't exist, is nothing but the creation of this supreme power. Tao is limitless, unborn, eternal. It can only be reached through the hidden creator. She is the very face of the absolute, the gate to the source of all things eternal. Listen to her voice, hear it echo through creation. Without fail, she reveals her presence. Without fail, she brings us to our own perfection. This talk is about the recognition of your true nature as presence consciousness. Endlessly creating, presence consciousness is endlessly creating its forms. Endlessly pulsating, it's always vibrating, it's always present. The spirit of the valley never dies, which is just another way of saying it. She is called the hidden creator. Although she becomes, this is talking about the mother of all things in that sense. Although she becomes the whole universe, she is. That's another way of saying she is. She becomes. She becomes. If you, when we're talking about cosmology, oftentimes we're talking in terms of time because it's sort of A, it's poetic, and B, it describes what came first or what is more fundamental. So often you'll see that first there was the one, then there was this, and then that gave rise to that. It's not actually that time is created in that way per se. It's more a symbolic way of stating what is deepest, and from which, from which does what come? From which does expression come? So when Lao Tzu apparently says, although she becomes the whole universe, meaning in its original form, she is herself. She is presence consciousness and then becomes the whole universe. But in present state, that is one and the same. Presence consciousness is the whole universe. Her immaculate purity is never lost, even though she becomes all that is. So even though presence consciousness becomes everything that can possibly exist or be present, it never loses its original space either. It only just multiplies or expands upon its own purity. It never loses. Lighting a candle with your candle does not diminish your flame. Although she assumes countless forms, her true identity remains intact. And so even in any form, her true form can be recognized. It doesn't matter what the form is. It doesn't matter what type of thought or emotion comes up for you, what type of struggle you have in everyday life, what type of events you attract to yourself vibrationally. It doesn't matter when it comes to self-realization. It matters a little bit when it comes to empowerment, investigation. Why is this happening? How am I doing this? But when it comes to self-realization, you can start to see that her true identity, the mother of all things, the presence of all things, remains intact. It doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter what's being experienced. It doesn't matter how much pain you have. Presence is right there in its immaculate form, always accessible. Any point in creation can always access isness or presence or beingness, precisely because it is. Anything that is, is. You see, if something is, if pain is, it is, and isness is the mother of all things. Whatever we see or don't see, whatever exists or doesn't exist, is nothing but the creation of this supreme power. Tao is limitless, unborn, eternal. It can only be reached through the hidden creator. She is the very face, which is consciousness, is the hidden creator. 
She is the very face of the Absolute. Consciousness or awareness is the face of the Absolute. There is the one, and then there is awareness. It's free agent. It's free creator. She is the very face of the Absolute. That's also what it feels like. When you realize the absolute or penetrate the veil of consciousness and you intuit what is beyond consciousness, what was before consciousness, the true original one, infinity, it almost starts to feel like awareness is emptied out. Awareness starts to become emptied out of feeling like it is the absolute. So even the awareness itself, even pure awareness becomes free of identity of itself. And then it feels like awareness is sort of like resting on the face of infinity. Like it's appearing on the horizon of this infinite vastness. It's just sitting there sort of, it's the face of, it's the front of infinity. It's the expression and face of infinity. She is the very face of the absolute, the gate to the source of all things eternal. You all know you're eternal, no? Do you all know you are eternal? Do you feel that? Can you know that ever more with every passing day? Can it become ever more clear to you that yes, you are eternal? Deathless, changeless, fearless, limitless, lackless. Listen to her voice, the hidden creator consciousness. Hear it echo through creation. Can you find an experience in creation where you're not conscious of it, where there's no consciousness? No one in existence has ever found an experience outside of consciousness. Everything is a dream within consciousness. So hear it echo through creation, throughout pervading creation, hear the echo of, which is another way of saying, recognize the presence of consciousness. I am consciousness here and now. I am consciousness there and then. I am consciousness in this and that experience. Recognize the echo of her voice. The voice is, I exist as presence consciousness. Without fail, she reveals her presence. Obviously, every moment is revealing the presence of presence, the presence of consciousness. Without fail, she brings us to our own perfection. If you follow that thread, if you recognize presence consciousness over and over again, it will lead you back into your own sense of natural, innate, indestructible perfection. You'll start to feel perfect, perfected. Perfection will start to pervade your sense of beingness. No matter what's happening, no matter what's happening in Siberia, no matter what's happening in wherever, perfection is perfection. You start to feel it in everything, no matter what it looks like. Doesn't mean you don't take action, it simply means that also in the action taking to counter certain impurities, you recognize perfection. You always recognize perfection, no matter what's going on. This also expands you beyond your personal bubble, your biased personal self of having an opinion about a circumstance, which limits you from the wisdom that is accessible to all of you in every given situation. You can be the father of your entire experience. You can be the guiding mother of your whole experience and everything involved. If only you have the courage to step beyond your own bias, see the natural perfection in all the things that occur. And from that space of wisdom, you can still make changes and see contrast, even clearer. But it will be executed with resolve, with confidence, with fearlessness, and without a sense of lack. Or I'm changing you because you're imperfect. No, I'm changing you because you are who I am and I care about your existence. Or I'm changing this, or I'm changing that, or I'm taking action. It's not so much changing things. It's allowing action to occur. It's allowing action to be executed. Heaven is ancient. Earth is long lasting. Why is this thought? Because they have no claims to life. By having no claims to life, 
they cannot be claimed by death. The sage puts his views behind, puts his own views behind, so ends up ahead. He stays a witness to life, so he endures. What could he grab for that he does not already have? See, this is the leckless conviction. What could he do for himself that the universe itself has not already done? If you really grok this, if you grok this whole verse, which is gorgeous to me, if you really make this your own, if you embody this, you will never suffer again. Doesn't mean you won't create challenge to expand even further, but you will never suffer again. Does that sound appealing? Or not? Some people doesn't. That's fine. Suffering creates this whole reinforced sense of validity. I'm valid because I'm suffering and I'm creating conflict and I'm this and that. I'm validated through my own suffering. So some people desire that because that's the closest they know or have associated with happiness or validation. The real validation they're looking for is the validation that's found by merging within themselves, merging with all that is, becoming inseparable, becoming courageous. Heaven is ancient, earth is long-lasting. Why is this so? Because they have no claims to life. They don't define themselves in a limited way. They don't say, oh, I am alive, I was born. And so their awareness, their consciousness, their essence cannot also be claimed by death. Cannot be claimed by death because they don't take claim that they're alive. They start to see beyond the illusion of being born and dying, being born and dying. Cycles all appear inside of consciousness. You are consciousness, you're not the cycles. The sage puts his own views behind, which is very crucial, it's very important. If you have biased views, it's very important that you put them behind you. But the only way to do that is to realize that there is no other way to get ahead, which is another way of saying to get to where you actually desire to be with the fullness of your being. If you actually wish to get to where your full being wants you to get to, and this goes for whatever state of being, it goes for circumstance, it goes for material stuff, it goes for everything, wherever you wish to be in your realization and your actualization. What you truly wish to be can only be reached if you put your own views behind you. What are views? Views are vibrations of consciousness. And they dictate and create circumstances and experiences. If your experiential realm does not feel like it's a representation of your true higher self's desire, your leckless passion, your inspiration, then you have to put your own views behind you because that's what's created the experience to begin with. If you can do that out of seeing that you're actually benefiting from doing so, because you can never, ever, ever take a step in a direction you don't perceive to have any benefit. It's a mechanical impossibility to do something that seems detrimental. So those that are courageous and brave, those that do things nobody else would, are those that can perceive beyond certain illusions and temporary states, and they can see the value of that action. They don't do it because they see it in the way that you see it. If somebody does something that seems outrageously courageous to you, they don't do that out of a state of more courage per se. They do that because they have a clear view of where they're headed, of what that will gain, reality, what that will benefit. You can never, ever, ever take a step, single step, in a direction you don't agree with. So courage is simply to expand your wisdom, to see that things sometimes make sense that don't make sense to other people, that don't make sense to our conditioned, limited reality. Then in a sense, you're not more courageous, although you, yes, you've had to work your way through your own views. Yes, you've had to have the willingness to take a clear look at yourself, and that does take courage. But again, you saw that that would benefit you, so you gained the courage. Courage is not something you have or don't have, not really. It's innate to every being. The clarity with which you see that certain things benefit you and other things don't, determines the amount of courage that is infused within your actions. You are perfectly 100% confident and courageous in your present set of views that generate your reality. If you wish to change that courageously, all you need to do is change where you perceive there to be a true benefit. What type of actions will lead to true benefit? 
So this is why it's important to go from ignorance to clarity, from ignorance to wisdom, so that from a pace of wisdom, a more expanded state of consciousness, you can simply see life from a wiser place, a point of view, and then your actions will naturally be executed in alignment with those new views. So the sage puts his old or own views behind, so ends up ahead. He stays a witness to life, so he endures. What does this refer to? He stays a witness to life. This does not necessarily refer to This does not necessarily refer to not ever acting, not ever participating with this universe. What it refers to is that even while you're participating, you're never, ever, ever coming to conclusions again. Imagine that. Imagine the freedom in that. That is what it means to endure. That is what it means to immortalize your well-being. I never come to conclusions anymore even when it seems like I do, even when I'm executing certain things, even when I'm creating certain scenarios or challenges or ideas. I never internally, I never ever ever get to a conclusion anymore. Maybe every once in a while it happens, at which point I will see that and deal with it in the same way. But for the vast majority of my experience, there is no coming to conclusions anymore. What does that mean? And what would that imply? What would that look like? What would that give you? How would you experience life if you'd never get to a conclusion? Again, you can only do this if you know lack does not exist. If you believe lack exists, you're going to get to conclusions all the time because those are your safe markers for where you're at, who you are, what's coming next, how you can protect yourself. They are reference points in the vast field of infinite possibilities. And those reference points were not clearly put there out of conscious intention, but put there out of fear, out of the belief that lack can occur, limit the field of infinite possibilities from your view. You limit your view from seeing infinite possibilities, infinite abundance, infinite lackless essence. You prevent yourself from accessing tapping into Tao and becoming Day, the full expression of Tao realized in form. So he stays a witness to life, so he endures. That's very much my experience of endurance. It's a fun word, but it's a funny term, but the feeling I have is when circumstances occur, when challenges arise, when intense dynamics happen, I have this infinite feeling of endurance. I endure no matter what. I remain a witness to the whole thing, even if I'm very, very active and participative in that particular scenario at the same time. My sense of self is rested to the point where it is a witness to all that's happening. And it doesn't come to conclusions or fears. It doesn't come to premature ideas about what's happening. You only need to come to conclusions if you need something out of the experience, if you need the outcome to change in order for you to know that you're infinite. Does that make sense? So be in the space of no conclusions. Doesn't mean you can't brainstorm. Doesn't mean you cannot access all these different points of view of a scenario to gain wisdom and even greater clarity and relative contextual wisdom as well. Wisdom that applies to certain scenarios or certain dynamics. You can expand in all those specific ways. And yet, at the same time, you have no need to come to arrive at a conclusion about what's happening or what's going to happen. So you endure because you remain a witness. You don't collapse into this is it. You don't collapse into naming things as this is what it actually is. You're not identified with your own perceptions and views. What could he grab for that he does not already have? Very true. What could you grab for that you don't already have? If you're saying, well, I don't have this, I don't have that, I can't, you're missing the point. You're placing your you on a too small of a scale to condition of a marker point. What could you grab for that you don't already have? You are all that is. You are the mother of all things. You are Tao. What is not yours already? Everything is omnipresent. Everything already exists, past and future. All alternate presence. All exists right now, right here, as part of the all that isness that is you. What could you grab for that's not already explored? that's not already gained, that's not already yours. If you feel into that true lacklessness, 
Like I said, you'll never suffer again, even when it seems like you are. What could he do for himself out of selfish motivations, out of need, out of lack, that the universe itself has not already done for him, for it, for itself? What could you do for yourself? Oh, let me do this for myself. That has not already been done on a universal scale. Nothing. You are everywhere at the same time. You don't have to see this. You can simply choose this knowingness. And by choosing this knowingness, you're in the frequency of knowing that, and then you can start to actually experience it. You can, you can never experience. You can never truly confirm and become experientially realized in something you do not first choose to be in the knowingness of, the choice of, the frequency of. So choose the frequency of knowing that you are all that is, that you've already done everything there is to be done. That you already have everything you need that you already contain everything that ever was, is, or will be. And simply by choosing that knowingness and turning your cheek to your old views, leaving your own views behind you for the sake of exchanging it with the view, I am all that is, I am eternal, I contain all that exists. The leckless point of view. A, you'll start to tap into bliss. Because bliss is simply the confirmation that your view is lined up with the universal truth. And then you'll never suffer again. Even when things arise, you will endure because you don't come to conclusions. Suffering is coming to conclusions. Now what if you did not come to any conclusion even about your own appearances? You cannot suffer. They are just appearances of consciousness. And you endure. You are a witness to it all. Participating when necessary. Investigating when relevant. But you endure. You witness, you're free. You're unconcluded. A conclusion has a start and an end. An unconcluded being does not have a start, it does not have an end, it endures, it becomes immortal. It starts to know itself as immortal. The best way to live, verse eight, the best way to live is to be like water. For water benefits all things and goes against none of them. It provides for all people and even cleanses those places a man is loath to go. In this way, it is just like Tao. Live in accordance with the nature of things. Build your house on solid ground. Keep your, min keep your mind still. When giving, be kind. When speaking, be truthful. When ruling, be just. When working, be one-pointed. When acting, remember, timing is everything. One who lives in accordance with nature does not go against the way of things. He moves in harmony with the present moment, always knowing the truth of just what to do. Hard to believe, huh? Or not, maybe not. Live in accordance with the nature of things. Build your house on solid ground. This refers to me, this is a symbol of common sense, like clarified common sense. Not to make any judgments, but those that are ignorant in that sense, just to use a word, those that are collapsed to their own bubble and only limited to their own views, that only talk about themselves, that only see themselves from a personal point of view, they have a very wretched or wicked or distorted sense of common sense. Common sense will always be distorted around the story that will give them something that they feel they're lacking. To simply state live in accordance with the nature of things pops that bubble, if you get that point of view. To live with, in accordance with the nature of things. Build your house on solid ground seems like such a mundane statement, but it's actually pretty profound. Build your house on solid ground like physically as well as metaphysically or symbolically. Build your house on solid ground. Rest yourself in what's truthful. Build your life on the solid ground of the mother of all things, the essence of Tao. Keep your mind still. Simply means centered, not so much still. Activity can arise. This book was written hundreds of years ago. Things are accelerating. The mental body is meant to participate a little more at this timing for humanity. So it's not so much about keeping still, it's not so much about just sit down and realize the truth and that's all that you're meant for. There's a few statements throughout the Tao Te Ching that are relevant for that time, that age. You have to see through these statements a little bit. 
So keep your mind still. Sure, that's a helpful practice, but it's not the ultimate view. To keep your mind still is not the ultimate goal. It's a means to an end. As soon as you found the end, forsaken the means, unless it still serves you. When giving, be kind. When giving, be kind. Be selfless. Know that you're giving out of joy. Know that you're giving because you're giving to the rest of yourself. All of yourself, all of your body, the rest of your body is benefiting. When speaking, be truthful. When speaking, be truthful. I like that he does not say, sort of confirms, confirming for me personally. When speaking, be kind. He says, when giving, be kind. And that very much resonates naturally with how I feel I operate. When speaking, be truthful. <laughs> Friends, family. When ruling, be just, not kind. When working, be one-pointed. Know what you want. When working, be one-pointed. Be very clear. Be without the personal bubble as much as you can. Be for the greater good, the sake of that project, the sake of that work, the sake of that action, the sake of that execution. When acting, remember, timing is everything. This refers to, in my experience, this refers to the intuitive sense that comes over you when you start to expand beyond your personal bubble and views. You start to, when act, you start to sense into the timing of things. You start to sense when something is infringing upon someone's free will and when it's not. You start to sense when a window is open and when it's closed. You start to sense exactly when to take that step and exactly when not to. You can become actually very, very clarified in this way. Your mental body or your intuitive body can become very, very crystallized, very, very optimized in this way. Shockingly so, most inhumanly so. Your timing, your sense of timing can become excellent. Your execution can become perfect. One who lives in accordance with nature does not go against the way of things. He moves in harmony with the present moment, always knowing the truth of just what to do. That's not a claim to arrogance. It's just how things work, and it makes sense. From a universal point of view, a universal skill, does it not make sense that all of its portions are able to execute its will perfectly in perfect timing if those portions are aware of their motherboard? If those portions are plugged in to where everything is directed from and there is no interference, there is no doubt, there is no hesitancy, there is no lack, there is no interference, there is no blocking of that intuitive knowledge, then does it not make sense that pure intelligence operates throughout all of its versions in perfect timing. If you have no interference, you act when you are moved to act. Act, And you don't act when you're not moved to act. If you interfere, then it's, it's kind of like martial arts, where you have to, in a sense, be empty of your personal views and personal mind. If you are thinking about when to act, you'll be too late, or you'll be too soon, or you'll be too clumsy. But if you become that empty space, if you become like water, you start to fill up that moment with perfect flow, with perfect action, with perfect execution. And you are not moving. It moves all by itself. You're simply a witness to it. You're simply allowing it to occur. Again, you endure. And this is one of my favorite verses, verse 10. And my ex-wife actually printed it out for me and put it in a list and I still have it. Um, and I bring it with me into every new house I have. Hold fast to the power of the one. It will unify the body and merge it with the spirit. It will cleanse the vision and reveal the world as flawless. It will focus the life force and make one supple as a newborn. As you love the people and rule the state, can you be free of self-interest? As the gates of heaven open and close, can you remain steadfast as a mother bird who sits with her nest? As your wisdom reaches the four corners of the world, can you keep the innocence of a beginner? Know this primal power that guides without forcing, that serves without seeking, that brings forth and sustains life, yet does not own or possess it. One who holds this power brings Tao to this very earth. He can triumph over a raging fire or the freeze of winter weather. Yet when he comes to rule the world, it's with the gentleness of a feather.
Wu is nothingness, emptiness, non-existence. Thirty spokes of a wheel all join at a common hub, yet only the hole at the center allows the wheel to spin. Clay is molded to form a cup, yet only the space within allows the cup to hold water. Walls are joined to make a room, yet only by cutting out a door and a window can one enter the room and live there. Thus, when a thing has existence alone, it is mere dead weight. Only when it has Wu does it have life. So everything, everything that you do, everything that you see, everything that you create, also will have this quality of Wu more and more, will have this quality of emptiness, of formlessness, of spaciousness, of freedom, of non-concluded beingness. And you actually do start to see and sense that all mechanics within the universe, within creation, operate simultaneously with Wu as it does with form. They are inseparable. And the Wu part is, we tend to focus on the things that appear. But what's essentially even more crucial is the space within which they appear. Or the reference, the space that's referenced by the very fact that something occurs. It references, oh, suddenly there is this space around the object. So you will naturally bring this more into your everyday life actions. The five colors blind the eye. The five tones deafen the ear. The five flavors dull the palate. Racing, hunting, and gall galloping about only disturb the mind. Wasting energy to obtain rare objects only impedes one's growth. So the sage is led by his inner truth and not his outer eye. He holds to what is deep and not what lies on the surface. This first paragraph can be a little deceiving, in my opinion, but the second one nicely wraps it up and balances it out. So the first one says, basically, stop racing, stop hunting, stop galloping about, stop wasting energy to obtain rare objects. Um, it only impedes your, your growth. The five colors de blind the eye, the five tones deafen the ear, the five flavors dull the palate, which is a little on the extreme side in terms of denying it's live denying. And again, from a teaching point of view, that can be relevant sometimes. But then it's always beautiful how usually the Tao also follows it up with a balancing statement. So the sage is led by his inner truth and not his outer eye. That does not, that does not exclude any, any journeying for rare objects if you want to, if that is part of your adventure, if that's part of your self-expression. He holds to what is deep and not what lies in the service. So even if you go about chasing rare objects in this world, even if you're obsessed with the colors that you see, the forms of this world, the passion that you have for it, the sage will hold to what is deep and not to what lies on the surface. Again, that's the same to not coming to any conclusions. It's to hold deep to the truth and to trust that everything works itself out perfectly and you're there to be a witness and a channel of the highest potential amount of light, love, wisdom that you can channel into that experience. So you endure, you hold to what is deep and you're not moved, you're not disturbed by the apparent surface reflections that could inspire you to come to conclusions. Instead, you hold to what is deep, you let the service be the service. And so what you emanate will naturally come from a very profound place and that will naturally allow things around you to flourish. The sage is led by his inner truth and not his outer eye. That's very true. That does not mean you cannot enjoy the colors of this world. Yes. Just so that the people at home can hear you. Max, is the microphone working? Hello. Hey. So would that also relate to the five senses? The, oh, in a sense. Or but like not relying on Not relying on, on the that. senses? It's more, it, the senses are clear. The sensors don't actually delude you. It's the, uh, it's the mind portion of your consciousness that comes to conclusions based on the senses. So using the sentence is just a symbolic way of saying, renounce your outer vision, renounce your reliance upon your conclusions, upon your own views. It's a more sort of physicalized way of saying the same thing. It's not actually saying close your eyes, close your ears, although that can be helpful too for some meditation practice. But it's saying basically don't be fooled by appearances. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Hold to what is true and deep. And okay. senses are included in that. But I, you're not, yeah? I wasn't thinking of senses like in that way anyway, okay. like touch or taste, okay. or, but the, the effect of the senses, how we perceive what is hot so we do not touch mm -hmm. instead of touching into it. 
mm -hmm. because it may not be hot or mm -hmm. So I was wondering if that was kind of on the esoteric um, description of the of how the senses can delude you, not physically shut off your ears or your eyes, or mm -hmm. but how we perceive through our sight and and hear through our inner ear um, yes. that could be Go deluded. Ahead. So yes. Um, so again, the senses are not actually deluded. It's the mind portion that becomes deluded. And yes, it utilizes, it's so tied into its physicality and the senses and the way it perceives the world that it's almost the same to say renounce your senses as it is to renounce your own views because they've become very, on the physical sort of moving about this world level, it has become, in a sense, a distraction. The senses have become a distraction even though the senses themselves are not distracting. They're just channeling information. But the way that the mind has collapsed itself around these senses and has created a sense of identity to be sort of like at the core of these five senses and therefore feels separate, it feels like it's endangered all the time, it feels like it needs to survive, it needs to struggle, it needs to be careful of things to a great extent. So in that sense, the senses have conditioned the mind, even though the senses always remain pure as they are, but they have conditioned the mind to start to believe in lack and danger and threat simply by means of observation. One of the ways of conditioning, one of the forms of conditioning that we have is actually what I call uh, physical conditioning. It's the conditioning based on circumstantial things. It's based on your physical perception of things. If you place a being, if you let it be born on a planet where there's no other humans, there's no society, so there's no social conditioning, there's no psychological conditioning in that sense, it would still condition itself to be separate to an extent. Why? Because when it runs too fast and it bumps into a rock, it hurts. That conditions the mind to pay attention in a certain way and to feel like, oh, I am over here. That rock is over there. So even on a very core sort of root chakra uh, energetic level, we are conditioned to respond as survival creatures. That's sort of our animalistic side. Animals are conditioned for separation to an extent, not psychologically or spiritually, but on a very mental physical level. They are also conditioned in separation simply by conditional hazards and the senses. That makes sense. So for the human, you will notice this if, let's say, a buzz comes your way and you didn't spot it you will have this instinctual response, this instinctual conditioned reaction to move out of the way. And, uh, or if somebody scares you in the middle of the night, then you will fire up and you'll have all these conditions like play out super fast. Sometimes you don't even notice what's going on. But that is because of that physicalized conditioning. And even that can start to soften. If you bring enough awareness into your everyday life, into your immortality, into your lecklessness, I have noticed that it's not completely gone, but the moment of when I'm triggered f because of something that happens that's very acute, that's very life-threatening, that or as somebody scares me or whatever, there may be that initial, but instantaneously, what I perceive to be instantaneously, maybe a nanosecond, there is the descending upon that sensation, that reaction of lackless awareness. So there may be that jolt of fear or, or, or conditioned response from the body-mind portion, but instantaneously there's the perception that no matter what happens, I'm fine. Does that make sense? So I'm almost triggered into even greater awareness. And every time that has happened, it has caused the next time for it to happen to be even less of a time uh, condition thing. It takes even less time for that to be resolved. So even this very rude core sort of physicalized animalistic type of conditioning can also start to soften to a great extent. But it's sort of one of the later types of conditioning to soften and go. It's not even really essential for your spirituality. It's just something that I've noticed. Does that answer your question? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, yes. It's on. It's on. Uh, you mentioned earlier um, about the two to five seconds uh, to bring us into presence and so on. Uh, and then you added... Uh, a number of weeks or something. This is just a, a, a little detail. Right. Because I haven't heard you say that before. Oh, right. So what was that? I said two to five seconds, mm -hmm. 12 times a day. Yeah. For at least three weeks, sincerely. Three weeks, okay. Sincerely. <laughs> okay. With dedication. Yes. All right, well, my question is, okay, this beautiful uh, 
work of art, um, is talking about the full flowering of many uh, different attributes of the sage. Mm. Okay, and so uh, I would like to hear you tell us a bit more about, okay, so we can now access presence through exercises such as mm -hmm. the two to five seconds, uh, but how can we take uh, uh, further steps on the journey to this full flowering of whichever mm. of the attributes? Mm. Uh, okay? Yes. Yeah, I'd like to have a little bit more how-to mm. to take home. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you for even having that desire. Um, and there's, there's this, actually, there's this slight unknowingness in me whether or not this is unique to certain individuals because it's relevant for that theme, or whether it's a universal thing. To be very honest, I've not seen enough people go through this whole process diligently enough or willingly enough for them to really arrive at a place where I see that they're operating from that father consciousness or mother consciousness, where they truly can be in their actions self-transcendent, even if it doesn't seem like they are. It's just, once you have the eye for it, you can tell whether people are in that state or not. I've not met many people that are, and so I don't actually have the proof or evidence to suggest that this is, whether this is unique to my theme, or whether this is something that is, I believe it is. Like intuitively, I believe it is available to everyone. It may simply not be as relevant in this lifetime for everyone to explore to that extent what it's like to be self-sacrificial, self-transcendent, to become your whole experience rather than just you, if that makes sense. Because that's the nature of your question, right? How to become, um, how to let things flourish around you and to... Yes, well, for example, that was one of the characteristics or attributes that the sage, uh, I mean, we're all trying to aim at furthering our expansion. Yes. Uh, whether there's a level called sage or not. But, um, for example, uh, yes, we are conscious of our bodies and equally conscious of the wall, as you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, personally, I would like to um, have increased access mm -hmm. to that and, and the feeling of consciousness being everywhere and I'm part of it, mm. okay, which seems like a mm. little bit uh, lower down on the ladder than some of these other attributes in the poem. But I, I, I would like more practical, you know, how to expand from where we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm regardless of which attribute it is that we're particularly drawn to. Right, right, okay, beautiful. A big part of it is service, is to be in the flow of service, is to be in the flow of giving, is to be in the flow of abundance, because that's what it is, it's all the same thing. To truly act on your excitement is actually to be of service, and to truly be of service is to actually be rooted in your abundance, in your excitement, in your ecstasy. There is no separation ultimately between these. So in a sense, you could approach it or you could enter that one singular stream of alignment from either one of these two angles mainly. One could be, for example, more of a self-realization point of view which allows for service often. The teachings of self-realization often promote service as a, um, a way to conduct yourself, as a way to achieve day to be of service, to see everything as yourself and to be of service in your sharing, in your teaching, in your example. And it's a very beautiful way to sort of jump into the stream of alignment. And that stream of alignment is what will expand you. It is what will expand your senses, your consciousness, your mental capacity. That's why I say it's not just about keeping the mind still anymore. It's about expanding. It's about simply knowing what you discover through stilling the mind, but then allowing every portion of yourself to be amplified by that, to be included in that. And so if we truly wish to get a greater sense of unity with our environment, unity with other people, um, being able to sense into what's actually going on for someone and where they're coming from and what their theme may be like and how you may be of service in the most precise timing-wise way. Is, are those some of the things you're talking about yeah. as certain extensions of the whole that you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. So in other words, to amplify yourself as a human, to make yourself that much more sensitive, that much more of service, and you can see how those two are tied in. It's not just about, oh, how can I become more powerful? And I don't get that at all from your question either. But it's not about, oh, how can I gain the power of telepathy or precise timing or feeling that the wall is inside my consciousness? Those are experiences. But what it's more about and what it's tied into directly is service. 
is giving, is inseparability. So, of course, you'll gain greater awareness of inseparability, which will give you access to everything, as the Tao said. So if you want greater access to all these possibilities, these potentials, these hidden, unlocked, unlocking these potentials within yourself, you have to be in that stream of, of, of abundance. The confidence in abundance will allow you to share and serve and be kind and be joyful and be truthful and be just and be, be the best you can be for the sake of the whole, not just anymore for your own views. So it requires continual transcendence of your own views. Just keep on expanding, keep on letting go of whatever you feel is making you feel clutched. Keep transcending that, keep expanding beyond that, keep investigating why do I feel clutched? Do I believe I will lack if I don't do this or that? Yes, oh beautiful, does lack actually exist? No, oh gorgeous, okay let it go. This is a very simple way of saying it, but eventually it becomes this easy because you become more confirmed and confident in the fact that lack actually does not exist. So through practice, it becomes easier and more swift and more effortless as soon as you spot a like belief to just know that it's not true because you already knew it's not true from previous prior practice. So continually expand beyond your sense of lack, your sense of limitation, so that your bubble expands until it in a sense pops and you can never suffer again in the same way that you did. The bubble expands, the bubble expands, at some point it starts to become so thin that it becomes transparent completely, that it becomes, in a sense, you pop the balloon, poof, and the air that was contained within your separation is now leaking out of your bubble into all the rest of yourself. So being of service, being really genuine with yourself, being really truthful in your actions, in your words, in your observations, holding on to the deep, profound changelessness of yourself and not to the service changes, Following your excitement with absolutely no expectation of how that's going to look like, what that's going to appear as, no outcome, just acting on your ecstasy, becoming more of that ecstasy, following your bliss, following the breadcrumb trail of your joy, one breadcrumb at a time. This is the most exciting to me now. This is the most exciting to me now. This is the most exciting to me now. And with integrity, keep doing that. That's one way to expand yourself as well, very fast, very rapidly to start to see the beliefs of limitation that will also hook you in to the live stream of inseparability and oneness and service and joy. And all these things, all these different ways into inseparability, service, joy, bliss, ecstasy, expansion will naturally, at your own pace, give you access again to those, in a sense, higher ways of seeing life or more expanded ways of sensing into your experience. Does that suffice? Or do you have a follow-up question? No? Oh, the mic. <laughs> Either way, well, I'll address both. Um, so <clears throat> my question applies to back when, when you first mentioned the father consciousness and allowing, you know, he doesn't, I forgot exactly the terminology, but it said like allowing anything in your experience. Mm. And when you were explaining it, you made the distinction of allowing anything that is beautiful and good and in alignment. But how do you sort out what's good and what's in alignment if you've set your beliefs behind you or your, mm -hmm. your preconceived notions behind you? Would, wouldn't anything that's coming to you be in alignment for you in that moment? And so you would have to allow it whether or not you were perceiving it as good or bad in order to release the clenching mm -hmm. and come into a deeper sense of like selflessness? Mm -hmm. Great question. It's both. Actually, you cannot distinguish what's in alignment and out of alignment from a place of personal bias. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, absolutely. So it's actually the other way around. Like it's not so much how can you know your preferences if you don't have any preferences. It's actually because you have your preferences that you don't know what your true preference is because you're too biased to perceive the clarity of that moment. So when you transcend your own sort of lower preferences, your cultivated needy preferences that are based in lack, that are based in, okay, I want social security, I want this, I want that, I want a partner to hold me at night, I want this, I want money, I want whatever it is. <laughs> so um, as soon as you transcend beyond that, or as soon as you just go beyond that and let that go, because you start to perceive lacklessness and the abundance of omnipresent existence, which is you, then you are transcending your own personal biases. And for the first time, really, your mental, emotional, intuitive body will be able to clearly discern what is in alignment and what is not in alignment. 
And here to the point of your question, what is not in alignment is still allowed to be there because it serves the purpose of showing what is in alignment. So A, from a relative story point of view, it's a positive attribute. It's actually an aligning attribute. Something that's out of alignment is in alignment because it shows you what is out or in of alignment. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And also on a more absolute, less story, re less contextual level, it's also benign. Why? Because it's the mother of all that is expressing itself in one of the ways that infinity can express itself. So you're completely welcoming disturbances as well. And at the same time, you're being very, very clear and crisp with what is in alignment and what's not. And even if your actions seem to be, what's that word, uh, adamant or something like that? Anyway, if you seem to be really intense on that point or really like decisive on that point of discernment, mm -hmm. f underneath that, your sense of being is still just doing this. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's the simultaneity of like, and don't you dare do that ever again or whatever it is that comes up, talking to yourself mostly. <laughs> Don't ever believe in that again. Whatever you're really specific and, and precise about, at the same time, you're actually not taking it seriously and you're actually welcoming it. But you're also not forsaking, you're also not uh, dismissing or denying the wisdom that is contextual. You're also allowing yourself to become more empowered to become more clear on what happens. And often spiritual people have a tendency to just want to stay in this space, which is a disservice ultimately, if it lingers there for too long. And that will cause disturbances, that will create less than ideal life circumstances, that will create certain types of perhaps even illnesses or complications at some point, even if that person seems to be completely enlightened because they're always welcoming everything and allowing everything. If they also do not include in that the true simultaneity of peace and joy and freedom and all is welcome and all is love, but also include the responsibility for who they are as a resonant chamber of creation, if they don't include that out of their conditioned enlightenment, enlightenment can also condition you, can immobilize you in a certain way. It happens all the time. I see it happen all the time. It's very common. And when that happens, that is good and well for a while because their frequency is fairly high comparatively because they are sensing and being and executing love most of the time. So yes, they will continue to attract relatively positive circumstances to themselves, often also to their detriment because it doesn't allow them to see as quickly as they could have, would they have attracted different things, but it's because their love needs to be reflected that they will attract to themselves fluffy experiences. And then at some point, the spirit goes, okay, now you've had enough time not taking responsibility for who you are in an individual expression, simultaneously with holding the space for all is allowed to be. And then it will cause actual circumstances that will actually point that person, that will sort of force that person to focus on their responsibilities once again. But it's the simultaneity of it. It's both end. It's not either or. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, sharing. I'm so excited about the Tao Te Ching and also your interpretations are very um, clarifying, mm. I think so. Thank you. Uh, my question, I think you might have just answered it, but it has a little different spin, but I think you might have just answered it. I'm acutely aware of the, um, I would say limitations, although you'd probably go to limitation, but of, of, the, of the language that we speak. So for example, mm. You said um, you channel, and I thought, well, wait a second, I either am, or what am I channeling? And then you said, oh, well, then you can be, or you might be animalistic. And I'm like, is that saying animalistic is not of divine consciousness, or it's, a, you know, something, I don't know. So, so language often catches me in ways that don't seem in alignment with what is true, uh, I think that was the answer to his question, you know, things that are in alignment with with what is really tr the big truth or the whole truth that I know, and then these things that are not in alignment just point to what is in alignment. I think that's what you just said, right? So I was uh, applying that to my difficulty with, you know, languaging that seems separating, mm -hmm. excluding, oppositional, mm -hmm. things like that. Awesome. So I don't know what you want to say about language in general, yes. but yes. thanks. <laughs> A 
in an ideal world, <laughs> no one would feel less than or more than anyone else. Their sense of inadequacy and lack would be completely dissolved from our consciousness. The perspective of unity and inseparability would be clear and obvious. And anything that can be said would only more confirm the beauty of all that is, the equality of all that is. And so no words can ever be perceived anymore as separative, isolating, opposing the truth. How could the truth be opposed? The truth makes up the words. The truth makes up the listener. The truth makes up the thought, oh, that word is out of alignment because it talks about hatred. Or that word is out of alignment because it refers to the animalistic as potentially less divine. When in an ideal world, ideally, if I make any distinction whatsoever between high and low, it'd be completely seen within the context of all that's accepted and all that's divine. And so it would not be taken, pers not saying this for you, I'm talking in general because I feel you're addressing a very present, at least in my personal life, with my personal interactions with people, a very present thing in my relationship, relationships, which is that I've often had, not so much anymore, but I've often attracted to myself experiences where people would not see the wisdom of my words, would not see the wisdom behind where I came from, because they were fooled by the words that I spoke, like partners or friends or whatever. And that is purely and alone, like what I could clearly see at some point is that like every conversation that was actually very potent if it was taken in a very non-selfish way, if it was not taken personally, the whole conversation would have uplifted every individual of that dynamic to such a high extent. But the resistance was there because of the sense we are inadequate or I can be inadequate. Does that make sense? As long as we believe, as long as there's an ounce of belief left that we can be inadequate, will be, there will be taboos. In my world, there is no taboo. In my personal closest circles, there is no taboo. And if there is, I'll make fun of it. I'll be somehow triggering that all the time, all the freaking time, because I can't stop that. There cannot be allowed to be any taboos in my personal environment. So sometimes I appear as an idiot. Sometimes I appear as a hateful, discriminative person. Sometimes I appear as whatever it may be on the surface. But I cannot change this. It's almost like this is not a choice from a personal point of view. It's just my heart wiring and I've come to accept that that is one of the ways in which I'm serving. And I've served myself because it puts me in the paradoxical place of not being seen, of not being understood, of something that is wisdom, that is love, to come forth in such a way that it's interpreted by those closest to me as hatred or illusion or ignorance or egotism. And so that gave me personally sort of the fire to go through of really relinquishing any need for personal recognition or personal relationships or friends loving me or liking me or understanding where I come from. Um, so, but so in an ideal world, if nobody feels separative, nobody believes they could be less than me or anyone else. And as soon as that belief is no longer there, conversation can take on a true teaching form that is agreed upon by all beings, not like one being teaching the rest. But if that is the case, then that's also accepted. In other words, I accept whatever anyone else has to tell me about something that I don't know about. Because that doesn't mean they're better than me, doesn't mean I'm reluctant to take their advice, and vice versa. Um, so words are always such a sensitive point in personal dynamics or spiritual dynamics because they seem to point on the surface, they seem to point to things that are actually contradictory to what is being shared, when actually it's not. But you gotta have the eyes to see that. You gotta have not even the eyes, you'll have the eyes if you have the willingness to see that. And to briefly return to my personal experience, it almost functions like a natural selection for me. Those that are able to hold on to the deep and not be discarded by the service, not come to conclusions of, of inadequacy and separation based on however I respond in that moment. They sort of make it through the natural selection process and they often end up being my closest friends and interacting with me more often than other people, if that makes sense. And those that cannot see past that layer that naturally, automatically, I'm hardwired to give off on a certain sense, which can be interpreted as arrogance and all that. 
will be um, naturally not be, at that point at least, part of my circle of natural friends. And those that do make it, like things flourish. Things flourish all around us. Things flourish because we're becoming one-pointed, we're becoming one mind, one consciousness. This is the true sense of community. But one has to have that trust, that faith, that underlying depth in themselves to be able to see beyond the surface of how other people act. And also this applies to our spiritual teachers or whatever. If we are too, we become too angry too often about something they say or too like fired up, like, oh, why would he say that? Or why would she say that? That could be a clear sign that, well, either the whole thing just doesn't resonate, but by that time you would already know that. But if just a single thing about that thing triggers you, it's very helpful to see where you still believe there is a taboo. Something is not divine. Because it's you that believe something is not divine if I say something that then triggers you believing it's not divine or it suggests something is not divine. Does that make sense? It's in the eye of the beholder, the perceiver. If you perceive me saying something that to you seems to be opposing the spiritual truth that all is divine, that means you believe something could potentially still be non-divine. I do not believe that. So I can say whatever the fuck I want to say. Does that make sense? And that is my personal experience all the time of taboo, of paradox. But to me, none of these are non-divine. So I can even say something like, um, certain types of people are not divine and everybody else is. And that would not imply non-divinity to me. I would not perceive in that statement any non-divinity, any taboo whatsoever. If I would perceive, if I would feel like any reluctance to say that or see through that lens, that means I still believe that it could be possible for them to not be divine. So it shows me, it shows me the very subtlest layers of my taboos, of where I actually believe I or something could not be defined. And then I'm on edge. I will take things personally. But as soon as that's eradicated, I can say whatever I want. Not that I always do, only when it's relevant. Am I being an idiot? I'm not just being an idiot for the fuck of it. I'm being an idiot when it's truly relevant in those dynamics to be an idiot, to appear as an idiot. But if there's no none of that sense, then there can be nothing that triggers you personally in that sense. No taboos. Imagine that. If there's still a taboo in your mind left, then that's a sensitive personal point that you should look at. If somebody can do or say something to you and you're like, you're not just like, this is out of alignment, I don't resonate with this, go fuck yourself. But you're actually, you're actually more like, what? How, how dare you? How can someone say that? If there's more that type of energy around anything that can be said, spoken, or executed, then that points to a belief in lack and separation. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank Thanks. you very much. Huh? Sorry? No taboos. That is divinity. Divinity is that all is inseparable. I do yeah. have a question. Okay, so yes. it's not really the content. Like, mm -hmm. I can understand that you are a loving being, and I trust that most everyone, that everyone has the... Nice. They really want to speak or be or be loved or exactly. am our love or whatever. But, and so where I, where I do get caught, and it will be mine to look at, is the constructed language that conveys separation all the time. It's like an I, other language. So I find that structure really confining and limiting and I don't like it. So that's just my thing mm -hmm. and I'll take a look at it. But I, I don't, I appreciate your idea about what's taboo and what's, yeah. um, what, did, what did you say where you, where you feel bad about something? But I, you know, I don't really uh -huh. feel bad about what you're saying. I don't feel bad about what you're saying at all. Right. I just don't like the language that you have to say it. I think it's it not reflective of, uh -huh. of, of the truth. I mean, it, isn't it? Isn't the truth yeah, reflected I, I, in everything? All right, I am moved to, ch to change it somehow so that it's even more reflective of the truth. And I don't really know how that, well, that's my desire. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Do you think language is limiting? Language is limiting? Yeah, um, or any language. That's a bit of a difficult question because it depends on the context, it depends on what level we're talking about, it depends on what the purpose is of the language. So I cannot really answer that unless you have a more specific question. Language, language essentially is not limiting at all. It doesn't do anything. Like you can write a negative word, just pick a word that you don't like, and you just write it on this wall in your imagination. 
Now take the first letter, does it mean anything? Take the second letter, does it mean anything? Take the third letter, does it mean anything? The whole word, does it mean anything? Yes, no. It doesn't mean anything either. It's pervaded by presence consciousness. It's pervaded by divinity. If you can hold to the deep and the profound and not be moved by the services, then you can truly know what your preference is and it might not be to change the language. Or it might be, but then you'll know where it truly comes from because your bias, your own views, your taboos are behind you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all. All right. Have fun. So we got to verse 12. I'll resume this from verse 13 next session. Uh, no, not next session. Next Tao Te Ching session. But uh, I'll be here next week, and I'm not sure what the topic was. But it's what is it? Does anyone know? Doesn't matter. I'm here next week. Uh, if you're not signed up for our local Boulder newsletter and you wish to be notified of these meetings with the theme mentioned, uh, come to Max or, yeah, come to Max and he'll sign you up at the computer real fast with your name and email. And thank you all. What about the academy? The academy is almost done and we are uh, beta testing and we are fine tuning and tweaking and putting the finishing touches on the academy. So expect it to be launched Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Thank you all. <laughs>